Welcome. So we have here an infinite solenoid, and we have used Ampere's law to find the magnetic field inside the solenoid is constant and in a constant direction. But in order to do that, we've made an assumption that the magnetic field outside was zero. So let's go through a little bit of why we made that assumption and whether we have right good reasons to say that or bad reasons to say that, and we'll go into a little bit of depth to really prove that it is in that way. So one thing we could do with Ampere's Law is we could make an Amperean loop that starts above the solenoid and goes quite a bit down below the solenoid. So right, we're going to have some sort of loop here and then continue along. And what we can do with this Amperean loop is right, we've got this closed integral of b dot ds is then going to be, right, if the magnetic field is this way in this direction, then it has to be returning back in this. So we have the negative b upper times l plus b lower times l, and that's equal to mu naught times the current enclosed. Well, whatever current we have up here, we have to have the same amount of current down here, so this has to equal zero. So what we're saying is that in order for these to be the same, that B upper has to equal B lower, which means that B outside is constant. So if the magnetic field outside is constant, right, we could draw it like we did where we have a significant difference between the distance from the solenoid here and the distance from the solenoid here. And obviously we can see, right, that this is a much smaller distance than this, and we could continue this all the way down to infinity. If we do that to all the way down to infinity, we really want our constant magnetic field to be zero, right? Zero would be a very nice constant for it to be. We're not quite sure if it would be that constant, though. So if you feel good that it must be uh, constant, then if that constant it must be zero, then we're fine. That's great. So another thing that we can do is we can treat this solenoid like it was a whole bunch of actual individual rings. We could treat it as if there was a distance L in both these directions, and we are looking at a point right here. If we're looking at individual points, we might look at a point here, this point P, and so from here we would go a distance R, and so we can say that this point is a distance z away from the center of the solenoid and then a distance r away from the center of the solenoid. And so if we're looking at this, then we can sum up a whole bunch of different of these rings. So we've got our center one here and our point that we are interested in here and we have that same lowercase r, capital R, and z. But then from the center of this ring, we are going to have the same capital R, because it's the same distance along all these rings, but a different distance, this distance being z minus z prime because we are saying that this distance between these is z prime. So what should the field look like from this? Well, we've got obviously right some distance here, so we should have something in the z and something in the r. But what we're saying is that if we add up all of these different rings, then we should be having the same symmetry as our solenoid. So our solenoidal symmetry as we've gotten from the book and as we've gotten from previous videos is that our magnetic field is only in the z direction and only as a function of r. So we don't have to worry about b sub r. The b sub r from this direction, this direction, this direction will cancel. And in fact, that's usually what the book talks about, right? We also might think that, right, in different directions it should cancel as well. But let's take a look at it. So the BZ for an individual ring
is far more complicated than what we want to do in this class. So I'm just going to write it out, right? We've got this mu naught IA over four pi times my Z minus Z prime squared minus R squared over the total distance, which is Z minus Z prime squared plus R squared to the five halves. So if we want to integrate or sum up all of these individual rings, right, we have to do a little bit of a trick. So we'll talk about the trick a little bit, but not too much, right? So then our dB is just going to change what's here. So our mu naught and our a don't change, our four pi doesn't change. Our current, we just have to consider each of these individual currents, which is going to be NIDZ over 2 capital L. And then we have the same stuff in here. And so then the BZ of the whole solenoid is going to be an integral from negative L to positive L of the BZ or the dBZ of an individual ring. So this is so far beyond what we want to do in this class, but I feel that I owe you an answer, so I'm kind of taking us through a couple of individual steps. So the BZ of our whole solenoid is then equal to mu naught N IA over 8 pi. And then we have Z minus L over Z minus L squared plus R squared to the 3 halves minus Z plus L over Z plus L quantity squared plus R squared to the 3 halves. So all of this is good. So then we're saying, right, if we have this point here, then everything is good. Now, if this is a finite collection of solenoids, we wouldn't get the symmetry. We'd have to do a little bit uglier stuff with the B sub R. But this could be our right end of it. But if we have an infinite solenoid, then we can use infinite solenoid properties. If that's the case, then this L is much, much larger than Z. Any point that we would be away from the center is going to be so small compared to the entire length of the solenoid. What this means is that Z plus L is approximately equal to L. Z minus L is approximately equal to negative L. So if we do that, then we get the magnetic field of the whole solenoid, mu naught n i a over 8 pi. And now we have right negative L over negative L quantity squared is just L squared plus R squared to the 3 halves. And then we have minus positive L over L squared plus R squared to the 3 halves. So then the L's cancel. We get negative 2L. That can cancel with uh, 2 of, or of the 8, but we don't have to worry too much about it. But let's look at this then. So we have mu naught INA over 8 pi, negative 2L over L squared. Now, one last trick. If L is actually infinite, then this distance is also going to be much, much larger than R. So this is just going to be L squared to the 3 halves or L to the 3 halves. And now let's take a look at this. So we have L over, oh sorry, L to the three, third power. 
So we have L over L to the third power, and we've established that L is very, very large. If L is very, very large, L over L to the third is just 1 over L squared or 1 over infinity squared. So the magnetic field of the solenoid is going to be roughly 0 because 1 over infinity squared is roughly 0. So this is why we can say, and again, remember that it's a constant. So it doesn't matter whether we're here or we're here. Because our solenoid is so long, and because each of these is then going to essentially cancel the field of the other, that any magnetic field outside of our solenoid, whether we are very close, somewhat far, or very far, is going to be dependent upon mainly the length of the solenoid, and thus will be 0.